and welcome to our session, which is on, as you said, it uh, environmental data acquisition and processing. So uh, this session is uh, led by a team from Dead and Timati University of Technology, and that's in Nyeri, Kenya. And uh, our university is situated within a very pristine ecosystem, and we are very, and that has really motivated us to work uh, leveraging technology to develop uh, solutions to ensure that we're able to to, to, to exploit resources when we have to, but exploit them in a, in a sustainable manner. Because we've witnessed the fact that environmental degradation is really affecting a lot of parts of the world. And the fact that we are not uh, taking care of, our, of nature the way it should be is leading to things like uh, extreme weather events. And we sit in an uh, engineering department and the question that we asked ourselves was, how can we leverage the technologies that are really making a huge impact in a lot of areas of the world, like health and other domains, how can we leverage that in, in environmental uh, conservation? So in our lab, we've been developing technology to monitor ecosystems acoustically. We have a conservancy within our university uh, in, in the first part of our session, we'll listen to, you'll hear from Gabriel as he talks about e acoustic ecosystem monitoring, where we develop technology to monitor bird species in our, in our neighboring ecosystems. And we've been collecting a lot of data and developing machine learning algorithms to, to detect these species as we want to monitor them. We've also been looking at how we can leverage IoT to monitor rivers within within nearby, near, near our university. And the idea here is that rivers provide a way to detect any unsustainable use of ecosystems. For example, if there's like a lot of logging that appears in how certain parameters like turbidity uh, of, of, of water in the river uh, looks like. So when we, if we can have uh, devices that are looking at our rivers, we can find a way to really easily measure the pulse of our ecosystem. So we've been developing this technology and during this session, we'll, we'd like to show you what we've been doing and also actually get hands on with our data and also uh, the, the technologies we've developed. So the first part will be with Gabriel talking about acoustic uh, ecosystem monitoring. Then we'll move over to Jason. who will look at anomaly detection in river level data. So all this is uh, from our lab that we call the Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at Data and Timothy. It's, we call it DCEL and that's our website. The repo for this session is on our GitHub page and that's a link right there. And we'll be able to post it in the chat. So over to you, uh, Gabriel, to take us through the acoustic session. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can all hear me. So my name is Gabriel Kiari from Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at Denan Kimad University of Technology in Kenya. So we'll be talking about environmental data acquisition, under which I'll be talking about acoustic monitoring of ecosystems. So welcome to this presentation. So over the past century, increase in human activity and climate change have resulted to severe degradation of ecosystem. And this has called us caused uh, endangering of various species that we have in our ecosystems. So this calls for increased efforts of conserving our ecosystem. So to conserve these uh, parks of ours, we need to collect data from them and then analyze the data to get the current status of the, the animals' habitats and also to monitor the trades taking place in them. So traditionally, this data is collected by carrying out physical surveys. However, these methods of data collection are inefficient. So we need to devise smart ways that we can collect data remotely and continuously. And that, therefore, we leverage technology to collect various forms of data, such as acoustic data and image data, which we can use to study our ecosystems. So in our case, we'll be talking about acoustic monitoring of ecosystems. And the principle behind this is that animals, like human beings, use sound as a form of communication. And the sound that these animals produce contain acoustic fingerprints that are unique to the species. So 
we can be able to tell different animals by just listening to them without having to see them. And we'll be talking about birds. So why birds? So birds respond quickly to changes taking place in their habitats. Therefore, uh, this is what ecolog ecologists uh, refer to as indicator species. So if we monitor birds, we can infer about the status of the other species. Also, they vocalize a lot, meaning that they are a good candidate for acoustic monitoring of our ecosystems. So in this uh, presentation, we'll be dealing with the grebacked camaroptera, which is the bird at the top, and the tropical bubu, and the hatlab sturaco, which are bird species found in Kenya. And we have 312 files of audio recordings of the grebacked camaroptera, that five files of the hatlab sturaco, and 154 files of tropical bubu. So there's a bit of bias for the hat lab sturaco, and we'll see that. So we, we need data to monitor the habitats of our animals. So to collect these data, uh, we have developed an acoustic sensor based on the Raspberry Pi. So technology has seen development of single computers that have the ability to record and process high quality sound. And such boards are the Raspberry Pi and the Jetson Nano. So we have developed a Raspberry Pi based acoustic sensor that we have deployed at the university's conservancy for data collection. So to the left uh, in this slide is the system at the lab when we were developing it and testing it. And to the right is after we deployed it at the university's conservancy. So you can read more about the, the system in the link that I've, I'll be sharing in the chats. So when we are developing sensors, one of the most important factor to consider is power. So the intention is to have the sensors last long in the field. So remember that uh, most of the sensors are deployed away from the field. So we have developed a power supply board to power the Raspberry Pi intelligently. And this board enables the Raspberry Pi to make decisions of when to shut down in case the battery level goes low and then schedule for wake up later. So we have also developed a program to enable the Raspberry Pi control the board, uh, which is outlined in this flowchart. So I will be sharing a blog I've written concerning the powering of the Raspberry Pi in the link in the chats later. So when we deploy acoustic sensor, a lot of data is collected. So and to get, make sense out of this data, we need to analyze it. So when we uh, opt for manual classification of data of this data, this may be cumbersome due to the large volume. So uh, this we have to solve this problem. Uh, by introducing such solutions as sampling, which in turn introduces bias and incompleteness in the analysis. So to go around this, uh, we can develop acoustic sensors that does the recording and then do the classification for us automatically. Therefore, we'll be getting the, the analyzed data and hence no need for the manual classification. So how is the automatic classification achieved? So you record the sound of a bird and then perform features extraction using digital signal processing. And in this case, it's the frequency component of the sound and then feed those features to machine learning models for classification. So to train machine learning models, we acquire data first. Uh, we will be using data from Zinokanto and uh, from our local deployment. Uh, Zinokanto is a public website where people upload our birds recording, then proceed to data pre-processing, then extract features from the raw audio data, and then proceed to data augmentation to manipulate the data, and then proceed to features generation that are then fed to machine learning models that are trained, saved, and then deployed to our acoustic centers for classification. So I've also developed a machine learning, um, a, a models testing pipeline that we are going to use for this workshop. So in this case, the pipeline is designed such that it can actively listen, waiting for acoustic trigger. And then when you get triggered by an acoustic, 
activity. It processes the, uh, that segment that exhibits acoustic activity, proceed to features extraction, data augmentation, then generate features from the processed data, and then predict the, the recording it has had. So some of the data pre-processing and augmentation methods that we have used is the signal noise separation. So remember that the sound that we have may contain background noise. So we perform signal noise separation. Also, some recording may be short compared to the threshold that we set. So we pad it with noise to make it the standard uh, length of recording that we intend to have. So the features that we are using are the mean and standard deviation of the frequency channels of the spectrograms that are generated from the audio data. So we could use the, uh, the, spec the spectrograms on the spectrograms directly, but also you can proceed to manipulate that and extract more features. And this worked well with the models that uh, we will be using for this workshop. So I've also developed a, a testing setup that we are going to use in this workshop. So we'll be using the Jetson Nano and we have some LEDs to indicate the different species that uh, will be playing back on the microphone. So uh, we have the requirements for the setup, uh, which are, I'm assuming that the active participants have. I've also outlined how you get started with Jetson Nano in the GitHub repo link provided there. Now let's proceed to the procedure for preparing the setup that we are going to show today. So uh, let's start with the breadboard. At the breadboard, uh, we have different connectivity of the breadboard. So we have the power rail at the top and the, at the bottom. So along the red line and the gray line, th th those are continuous. Also, we have the terminal strips there that are continuous going downward. We have a divider for the upper terminal strip and the lower terminal strip. Uh, we have the continuity going downward in these rows. Also at the, the, the bottom power rail, we have continuity along the red line and the gray line. So that will be important when it comes to connect to setting up the setup. So, and this is how we are going to set up to prepare our setup. So I'm going to shift my camera so that uh, we can get started with preparing the setup. For the participants who are to actively take part in the, uh, the, present, the, the testing of the models. So kindly make sure that the components that you are provided with are ready. So with me, I have a breadboard and with LEDs and three resistors, 220 ohms. I have a power supply for the Jetson Nano. I have a micro USB type B and jumper cables in the Jetson Nano and the USB microphone. So my USB microphone might be different compared to yours, but it should work. So I hope everyone has everything set up. And let's begin with the, make the preparing the setup. So let me unplug this so that we can start all over. So I hope you have mastered what we have uh, on what we have talked about the breadboard, because that will be very important when it comes to making the connection. So 
So let's start with the LED. I'm going to start with the, for my case, I'll start with this LED. And then on the lower terminal strip, I'm going to uh, note, also note the polarity of the LED. So we have one pin that is, one leg that is longer compared to the other leg. And the, the, the longer leg is the positive terminal and the shorter leg is the negative terminal. So we are going to start with the longer leg in the lower compartment. So I hope everyone is following and if you, you are stuck or you're not getting what I'm talking about, kindly be, feel free to, uh, to ask that. Preferably in the question and answer platform. So let's start with the first LED. So I'm taking uh, the longer leg in the lower strip. I'm going to plug it in there in one of the hole. And then the other shorter leg goes to the upper strip, the upper compartment of strips, and then plug it in there this way. I hope you can see. So then let's proceed to the second LED. So same case, maybe in, in the middle. And then let's proceed to the last LED. Let's plug it at the other end. And then let's take the first resistor. So along the same line that you plugged the shorter leg. So plug in the resistor in the strip, the compartment of the strip, one leg in the compartment of the strip and the other leg in one of the row of the power rail. Uh, this way, I hope you can see that. Then proceed to the next LED and plug the other resistor that way. Then proceed to the last LED and plug it that way. Next, uh, we will take the Jetson Nano and hold it with the heat sink upside, hold it that way. And then we are going to take the first connect a jumper wire. And then from the, from bottom up, so in and the outer row of the pins, we are going to count one to 10. And at the 10th pin, insert the jumper, uh, the jumper cable. That should be GPL 19. And then take the next jumper cable, proceed to the next pin up, the next pin to the one that you have just placed the previous jumper cable. That is pin 21, plug in the next jumper cable and then pick the other jumper cable. And then the pin next to the one that you've just plugged in, that is on the top side, plug in the next jumper cable. And finally, we are going to take the last jumper cable and connect it to the pin next to the one that you've just plugged in, that is the ground pin. So you should have such a connection. So let me check if you have questions so far. There's a, a couple of questions from Mission, uh, Gabriel. Yeah. Mission, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask that question? Mm -hmm. Can I ask the
Let me. Well, um, uh, okay. Le uh, right now, I would like to take the any question concerning the hardware setup. So uh, those are the questions concerning the uh, the material that I've just presented. Uh, I may take that later. I'm not sure your mic was working with him. Yeah, I can. Is there someone who is trying to speak? Because I could hear some background noise. Sorry, I think Mission's uh, microphone is not working, so I've just, I've just been on, on mute temporarily. Uh, I can see no question concerning the setup. The others are about running the models, which you are yet to get to. So I hope everyone has followed up to that point of setting up the setup. So. Uh, Gabriel, there's one question in the Q&A about uh, so should link the shutter pin of the LED to the resistor. Yeah, so the shutter pin is the ground pin and it's being linked to the resistor. And then the one leg of the resistor in the, with the shutter leg of the LED and then the other leg of the resistor goes to the power rail. I hope that answers the question. I'm enjoy. Okay, so let's proceed to connecting the jumper cables in the breadboard. So we are going to take the first jumper cable that you connected and then in the strip where you connected the longer leg along that line, connect the first jumper cable that way. Then proceed, pick the next jumper cable and connect it to the second LED along that line, make sure they're in the same line, this way. And then pick the, that one and connect it to the last LED, this way. And finally, we are going to take the crown and connect it in one of the holes in the power rail that all your resistors are terminating at. So make sure that the resistors are terminating in a common power rail and in any hole, you can uh, plug in the ground pin this way. Okay, so let's proceed to, now the setup is ready. Now let's plug in our microphone before powering our Jetson. So I've just plugged in my microphone to one of the USB ports. And then I can now power my Jetson Nano. I'm going to take the power cable. And then take the micro USB, connect it to your computer, and to into the Jetson Nano. So that's my setup. I've connected the power cable and the micro USB type B, one head to the Jetson Nano and the other head goes to my computer. And the power cable is connected to the wall socket. So I'm going to power on the Jetson as I take any question. So let's wait for the Jetson to boot.
in about a minute, it should be ready. In which we proceed to access the command line using the party software. Maybe Gabriel, in the meantime, we can answer some of the questions like uh, from Jesus who was asking what challenges you solve in the application because he is a lot of power energy consumption and weather challenges could be a challenge. How do you deal with weather challenges and the consumption of energy? So uh, currently uh, we, have we have developed a system that is able to work during a given wind time window such that it wakes up during a certain time, then shut down during, uh, after a given period of time, waiting for tomorrow. So for the case of power, our system is, power, is, solar, is, power, is solar, powered by a solar panel and a battery system. Uh, yet that is not enough to keep the system running throughout the day. So until that maybe point, we'll have some very high quality batteries that can be able to solve the problem of uh, the, the system of ours, that is the Raspberry Pi being a power hungry device. Uh, so that's maybe when we'll see that we have developed a system that can run throughout the day. But for now, we have a system that runs during a certain window uh, of the day because of power factor. I hope that answers the question. So, okay, let's proceed to access the command line of the of the Jetson Nano. I can see no question. So I'm assuming everyone has been able to access the command line. And then in the website that was provided, so I'm going to share a link where you will get the instructions to the commands that we are going to be running for this session. So I've shared the link in the text. So kindly go to that page. Uh, go there with me. And then uh, go down to the bottom of the read myth. And then under workshop instruction, click expand to expand. And then go to the last segment that is testing the models. Click to expand that. And then copy these commands. The CD, ARM, dev, summit, bioacoustic, the command, those commands. Copy them. And we are going to paste that in the terminal. So I hope everyone is with me. So if you are stuck in here, kindly feel free to ask. So I'm going to, I've copied my, the commands. So uh, what I'll be doing is 
uh, the system, I'm going to, when I paste these commands, what the system is going to do is first calibrate and set a silent, something that will be set as the silent condition, which will be compared to determine presence of acoustic activity. So during that period, I will be silent. Also, so when it comes to playing back the audio files, I'll be silent too, because I don't want intended to introduce noise to the playbacks. So, and the order in which I'm going to play the files are, I will start with the playback camera rupture files, proceed to the heart lab Sturaco and the tropical bubu. So in the way I've connected the LEDs, the first LED will be used to represent the Grebach Ramarotra, second LED, the Heart Lab Sturaco, and the last LED, the Tropical Google. So I've arranged them alphabetically. So I hope you've copied now the commands. Now let's proceed to pasting the commands on the terminal, after which we'll play back the files for the system to identify the, the species it has had. So let me shift to the command line. So I need to clear this. And I paste the commands. to be an issue with some background noise here.
those who are trying, are you getting correct results? I seem to be having some issue with some background noise here. Yeah, it seems there's uh, another participant who is also getting just the noise classification. Would it would it uh, be useful to try and rerun, to kill it and recalibrate? Okay, let me try that. Maybe for participants, just try and recalibrate as well, because I think when you are uh, Gabriel, when you were calibrating, it was it was quite a bit noisy. I don't know if it set the threshold too high. Okay, we, we have uh, one who may be having a bit better luck than the rest of us. Faik is here. Mm -hmm. So I can see Faik Sagla. He has some correctly classified. Yeah, it could be some issue also with the level of the mic. Yeah. Okay, just uh, calibrate. I have a question from Mark. Um, Mark, can you um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hi. Um, just wondering what is actually happening on that calibration step there? So the, the system is setting a condition that will be set as the silent condition, and then it will be comparing that to detect acoustic activity. Okay, so it's setting of the background level of the microphone, the gain on the microphone effectively. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so can, can we have comments on the performance of the model? I'm seeming to be having some issue with noise on my side. Seems people are having to hold um, the phone very, very close to the microphone. I think that's quite common. Yeah, 
and the models that have used may be sensitive to the acoustic activity, uh, to the acoustic environment. So you may uh, need to have the, the playback as close to the microphone as possible. So I can see it's working for, for Mark, for Kayo. Okay, this one participant too. Mission. So for Jared, for she, yeah, the microphone I'm using is a bit different from which you're using, but it should work. This the Spark Fun Kit. So Faik Saka, can you comment on the performance of CSBM kindly? Yes, uh, SVM uh, is better than a multi-layer perceptron. Okay. Uh, uh, in my experience. Okay. Uh, but uh, these should be tested uh, truly. So uh, we have to uh, play the files uh, again and again with uh, maybe microphone uh, and the uh, telephone uh, are uh, fixed in position. Okay. So maybe uh, we have to uh, find the level uh, of the uh, sound as it is uh, uh, measured by the uh, microphone and uh, taken by the system, uh, Nano. So these are, I think, uh, very, uh, these uh, very influenced the uh, uh, performance of the algorithm. Thank you. You're welcome. So, okay, good. There's a question about whether the project is open source. Yes, the, the code is open, is on GitHub. And the repo is open. Uh, yeah, so that's open source. I think we haven't placed a license, but yeah, that would be we will fix that it's open source. So Ted is saying that the model seemed to work okay with out the C command. Uh, yeah, so Ted, the C command was either to opt to deal with the file as whole or split it into chunks. So if the C command is false, oh yeah, it could be that Ted, you're using the uh, a previous format of the program I had prepared. So if you were getting issues with the C command present, that could have been the issue, but the C command, the, the, C, the C option is to, to either opt for splitting the files into chunks or treating it as whole. Uh, what do you mean, Ted, by unplug, replug, did not correct the error? Ted was having, um, getting an error when he ran the program, uh, and it looked like the microphone wasn't detected or isn't working. So I asked him to unplug it and plug it back in again. It's possible he has a faulty microphone. Mm -hmm. So have you tried uh, the, the different ports? So I, I understand maybe the different ports may be diff of different kind of version. We have the 3.0 and 2.0. So you can try a different USB port if it's not working with one. So 
So Hector yeah, will be sharing this, the slides and the link. And the links too. I think for the purpose of time, let's proceed to conclusion so that the next presenter can present. And I will be answering the question in chat if you still have more questions. So with uh, this kind of setup, uh, if we can be able to deploy it in our ecosystem, we can be able to identify different bands from their vocalization and therefore uh, able to monitor what's happening in them. So that is the intention. I uh, will be deploying the models in the, uh, the acoustic sense that we have developed and then deploy it in the different habitats of animals that we have around here and then be able to monitor them remotely and continuously. So in conclusion, I want to acknowledge the National Research Fund and Google for funding this project. And thank you all for listening. So let me welcome my colleague, Jason, to take you through his part. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gabriel, for that wonderful presentation. So if you still have questions for him, you can post them on the chat as I take you through the next session on anomaly detection of water level data. We'll start with sharing a couple of slides here just to show you what we are working on. And basically it's water resource monitoring. And I will start by introducing myself. My name is Jason Kaffee from Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at the Kemadi University in Nyeri, Kenya. I'll be taking you through water resource monitoring. And basically, I'll break it down into what parameters of water are we monitoring and why are we monitoring them, how parameters are being monitored, the hardware development part of it, the data acquisition part of it, and the data analysis, that is the anomaly detection part. So a quick introduction into the whole idea is that the, the main goal is river catchment analysis using water level data by leveraging IoT and machine learning. So when due to population increase and encroachment of river catchments all over the world and mostly also in Africa and specifically in Kenya, we have, we need to monitor the, our catchments and how they are doing on the status that they, are, that they are in. So by monitoring data set like water level, water turbidity in the water, you can actually give a qualitative analysis about the river catchment. So on my diagram on the right there, you have some bare land where there is less infiltration and we have some land covered with vegetation. So where there is more infiltration of water. So when the land is bare due to encroachment and logging, the water, the water level when there is a when there's a lot of rain for the water level tend to rise very quickly, as opposed to when the land is covered with vegetation. So by taking that that information of a long time, the water level information of a long time, you might be give a qualitative analysis about the how the catchment is. So the question really comes down to how long does a spike in water level take to occur after a spike in rainfall? And also other kind of data set like the, the amount of flow rate in the water and how long does the flow rate take to increase to a certain point? Also the water turbidity of, the, of a certain, because you expect when the area is, is pristine and has not experienced a lot of encroachment, the water turbidity is very low as experienced 
as opposed to when the area is encroached by human beings and there is a lot of logging. So the, there is, the water is a little bit cloudy. So that such kind of information can be used to give us some qualitative analysis about the catchment. So moving on, the area of under study is the Moringato catchment. This is where our university is located. That is the Dunkemath University. And it is a very nice specimen because as you can see on the diagram on the left, the dense, the dense green here indicate that that's a forest. As you move out to the red patches and the gray patches where they are, there is settlements and farming lands. So the river in question is the Moringato River and the catchment is the green area as it moves out to the settlement. So it is a very small area compared to the whole country, but it is a very nice specimen of study. So basically this is the river as it moves out, out of the forested areas into the settlement, settled areas and all. And the red dots here indicate our water level devices and our water turbidity devices. And we are collecting data from them using Roller, that is the IoT network, the long range wide area network to handle the data transmission from these deployed devices along the river to the cloud where we are able to access the data. So the hardware to support that was basically that we have the river itself. Then you have the, the, the device that is collecting the water level data. That is the a simple ultrasonic sensor, a PCB and a microcontroller to handle all the communication through the LoRa. We have the gateway that connects the head node to the IoT network server. Then we, we reroute the data to, the, to a cloud database where we can now do some anomaly detection. I'll talk, talk a little bit about that, anomaly detection to get rid of the anomalies in the data. And now further machine learning that is prediction models. And also we can display the data on the data on a, on a web app or a dashboard in this case. So this was the, our initial setup. You have the roller transceiver that handles the data transmission. You have the main microcontroller, which is the Arduino Nano. Then you have the ultrasonic sensor, which now collects the water level data. And now we, with this hardware, now we cannot do monitoring with this hardware on the breadboard. So we converted that into a deployable package. So you have a battery that powers the whole thing. You have the transceiver, that's the raw transceiver, the Arduino Nano, the ultrasonic sensor that collects the, the water level data. You can see it on a PCB. And now this is deployable as indicated by the diagram on the right there. So this can be deployed at a bridge or at a suitable location. So our main goal today is anomaly detection of the data we have been collecting for now we have the data for two years from four, four of our devices along the river, different sections. And today I'll be going through a normal detection of a certain sample, sample data set that, I've been, that I collected from one of the sensors. So basically is that we are trying to get rid of these random anomalies and come up with a clean data set, maybe two data points per day, because water level is a very, is the parameter that does, doesn't change for does not change for a long time. So maybe frequently. So you need maybe two data points per day or even one data point per day can do. And that is the what we'll be try, trying to go through on our Jupyter notebook that, I, that I've already provided to you. So we are moving from this to this. So, Let's head into the Jupyter notebook and I'll be sharing that with you too. Hope you can, you are able to set up the environment so that we can go through it together. If you are not able on our Git, GitHub, GitHub repo on our instructions, we had a, a link to a Jupyter call, a call up notebook where you can actually load up the data set that was provided and you can actually go to, together through it.
So So this is the, hope you can see this, the Jupyter Note, the Google Colab. You can use this, or if you, if you were able to set up the environment for, for this, we can use this too. So either can work. So basically an introduction, the, what are the anomalies in IoT data? So basically these are unexpected readings from a sensor that you have deployed into the world because most of the sensor use, used for environmental focusing maybe are prone to vandalism, breakage. And so we have anomalies that are in the data that is collected. So our main aim today is using classic clustering as one of the machine learning methods, clustering to get rid of anomalies. So anomaly detection is a very important step. So by clustering, clustering is an unsupervised machine learning technique that can be used to get an intuition or understanding of the data that has been collected. Say you have a very large data set, you might use clustering maybe to get a, just a rough idea about how the data is if you are not the one who collected the data. So like the name states, it's just clustering the data points into, into subgroups and here the, clusters that the same cluster have very similar data points, but different clusters have different data points. And today we'll be using k-means, which is one of the machine learning technique on scikit-learn, Python. So we are able to cluster using k-means in that you have various data points plotted out and you can have, have them in clusters, maybe one cluster, three, two clusters, according to your preference. So K-means is basically also a machine, and an, like I said, an unsupervised machine learning technique called the clustering techniques that are involved. So used to identify clusters in data objects. And with that, the step followed is that you initialize your number of clusters that you want for your data. Then you initialize centers, centers into various upon the, in the data. Then you iterate through the centers until the centers can change anymore. And with that, you assign each data point to a certain centroid, depending on how far the data point is from a certain centroid. So it is, if it is near to a certain centroid, you assign it to that. If it is very far from another centroid, you obviously know that it doesn't belong to that cluster. So that is what it basically utilizing K means. And our first cell here, we are able to generate two Gaussians. So we have a Gaussians just to indicate what how class K means K means is used. So we have we can generate two clusters, one here, another one here. And using K means we'll be able to cluster these two data points as a simple example before we go to clustering the data that I have. So basically from just looking at the data, you can see that we actually have two clusters. And by, the, by this, on our first line here, we are able to state the number of clusters. And by running the second cell, you can simply actually cluster the two, all the data points. You have one cluster here, another one, another cluster here, and you have the centers of these clusters indicated by the yellow blobs. So the information here is that you can see the cluster centers and also the data labels. And the, one of the factors in the that we are able to utilize is that these data labels, ones indicate another one cluster, zeros indicate another cluster. So you basically you have two clusters. So every data point is provided a label depending on which clusters it is. And by running this cell, you can actually cluster two of the three, these three data points. One is given a zero to indicate this cluster, the other one to indicate that, then a zero to indicate that. So diving into our data set for today, we start by running this. Then we plot out the data. You can see that this data from the sensor 
water level data date. So basically we are clustering the y axis. So clustering can be done in two dimension. That is the y and x, or you can cluster it in 1D, which is so like for this data here. So we have the anomalies that you want to get rid of here. Then you have the clean data, the clean cluster that you want to retain. So by running, running the, the consecutive cells, you're able to Now you have this plot, you're able to cluster out the data that you have four clusters. I need four clusters for my data. And you can see the main cluster. It's very well defined through the graph. Then you can see the anomalies here, the cyan class, you have the red cluster, you have the brownish cluster, you have the purple cluster, which is the main cluster that you want to retain. So we can use utilize the labels the k-means labels to get rid of these three clusters and begin with the purple cluster. So by running the next cell, we are able to plot out a histogram that shows you the main cluster has around 1,617 data points. Then you have the normal clusters. And the main assumption is that the main cluster has the correct data points. And with that, you can utilize the k-means labels on our next cell. And you are able to retain the main cluster here. Then you are able to get rid of the others. So by that, you can plot out the mean, the water level mean for, for all the days that we are plotted out. And you can have a nice bar graph. have a nice bar graph for all those days. Also, you can compare the data sets with the rainfall data set that we have been. We have also been collecting data, the rainfall data, the water level data from when we have been collecting. This data came from this sensor from February. So the sensor has been on from February this year. Up to now, it's still working. So you can actually see the, the red plot that shows you the water level and the green bar, the, the blue bars that shows you the rainfall. So basically, you can actually see that our, our water level data actually coincides with the rainfall data. And with that, at, at this extreme end, you can see that the rainfall is, there is a lot of rainfall, but the water level is very low. So that is a very interesting area of study. So basically, that is how we we can actually get seed of all those anomalies from the data set. And this is a, a web app that we prepared to show you the how where the, the sensors are. This is our university here, the Kemal University. Then you have the rivers, the river course as the sensors are very far from this, but this is basically a map. Let me share with view this. But this is a link to a link to this web app where you can actually visualize the data from some of the sensors that are being that are the four sensors that are deployed. You have the real-time data coming in from this is sensor six. Actually, if I drag this out back to February, maybe 11, let's go with that. I'll take this back to today. So basically, this is the sensor. You can see this is 20th today. The, the water level data has been coming in at intervals of five minutes, but five minutes can be oversampling in some cases. So you just calculate a daily mean. You get rid of these anomaly here, like you can spot that anomaly there, and you calculate the daily mean because the 
the plot is pretty clear all through. So basically, this is where we receive our real-time data from. These are sensor two, sensor one, sensor seven, sensor six. So sensor six. Yeah, you can see the plot for sensor six. Yes, they are anomalies, but you can utilize k-means or other methods of anomaly detection in detecting these anomalies. But you can see there are rises in water level, then drops depending on the rainfall patterns. So this data from back in February until today, then you can actually go through other water level, other sensors, then you can cluster. You can cluster using k-means for a certain day, maybe today 20th, and see what. Yeah, that's sensor six, a I mean of three, 0 0.34 meters. You can see the trend here for sensor six. You can compare with the rainfall from, from various weather stations, and you can actually download the data that comes in from the sensors. So basically, this is a simple web app that we utilize to visualize the data. So with that, I will let I will end it there for today. And I direct you to our GitHub repo where all this information is available on also on our website at dkmtdcell.github.io where you can find all this information. So thank you for your time. Over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, thank you, our interactive guests and our attendees for making this uh, such a fantastic session. Um, the workshop has been recorded and will be available on demand via the Dev Summit platform within a day or two. Um, in the meantime, please explore the available content and enjoy the rest of Dev Summit. Goodbye for now. Kawahari.